Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you're up against something you can't handle and it has to be kept strictly confidential, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Mr. Valentine, the day after tomorrow, a boy 16 is getting out of a work camp after a year. Instead of trying to get a new start, he swears he's going to do something that'll take him right back there again, or even worse. You've got to help him. You've got to save him from himself. I don't have much money. I'm only 16, too. Only 16, too. But I'll work the rest of my life paying you if you'll do everything you can to help Eddie. I'll be waiting for you tomorrow morning at 7 in front of the Lincoln statue in Chelsea Square Park. And it's just signed Emily, George. Yeah. Chelsea Square Park, huh? Brooksy, that's right in the middle of that slum jungle where those so-called wolf packs have been running wild. Yes, and kids just about this age. Always good for an editorial. Young hoodlums, a challenge to society. And that's where it usually ends. Brooksy, looks like we're going to be on the job early tomorrow morning. <laughs> George, wait a minute. What is it, Brooksy? Over there, sitting under the statue of Lincoln. There, feeding the pigeons. Oh, yeah. Looks like our girl, all right. Come on, Angel. Let's see how unlike an editorial we can be when we talk to her. Now, that's all the crumbs I have. No use hanging your arm. Go on. Scoop. Scoop. Go on. <laughs> Emily? Yes? Oh, Mr. Valentine? Yeah, that's right. Gosh, I didn't really believe you'd come, and I... Hello, well, Emily. I... This is Miss Brooks. We work together. How do you do? Hello, Miss Brooks. If things weren't so terrible for Eddie, I'd, I'd feel pretty silly. I don't have anything in the world, and there's no reason for you to help me. Well, and... let's just say you write a darn good letter. Now, what about Eddie, Emily? He's a boy I know. He gets out tomorrow. Why was he sent away? The police found him in a stolen car. I see. But he didn't steal it. He thought he was delivering the car to a second-hand dealer for somebody just to make a little extra money. Well, didn't he tell that to the police? No. He just kept insisting over and over that he didn't steal it. He wouldn't even tell me who got him into that trouble. But he says that since everybody is so sure he's no good, he's going to prove they're right. You know what that means. Oh, now, Emily. Well, I know Eddie. He's lost his temper a lot of times, and he got into scrapes, but, well, he's not bad, not really. Emily, you're pretty sure of that, aren't you? I suppose when you believe in somebody... You... Just do, that's all. All right. Now let's see what we can do. He has no place to go, Mr. Valentine. What do you mean? He only has his father, and Eddie was supporting Mr. Prokosh, selling papers. Yes? Well, when Eddie was arrested, Mr. Prokosh told him he never wanted to see him again. And Eddie's very proud. He'd never go back home now. Well, people change a lot in a year. Do they? My mother and father haven't. They still think Eddie's no good. And even now, when I went to help him, I have to meet you in the park before I go to school. All right, Emily, suppose you leave Eddie to me. I'm going to secretarial school now, and in another year I'll start working. And if you don't mind waiting, oh, I suppose could... you leave that to Mr. Valentine, too. Then you mean you'll do everything you can? <laughs> that and a little more, Emily. Now, suppose we go and have some breakfast so you can tell me all about Eddie. Then I'm going to have a talk with his father. <laughs> I don't care who you are. I want to hear nothing about my son. I got no son. Now get out of my house. Now just take it easy, Mr. Prokash. Look at me, mister. You see this crippled leg? I got that making honest living. Honest living. I know. That's dreadful, Mr. Prokash. But there's still Eddie to think about. I get few pennies from the company every month. I even bite my tongue and take charity from the Morrissey Association. But better I should hate myself than take one dirty penny my son steals. I don't need it. But maybe your son needs you. I told you, lady, I got no son. Okay. Okay, let's just call him another boy, age 16. A boy in trouble and headed for more. But not everybody sold off in the way you are. His own father. You know, Mr. Prokosh, you can worry so much about being right that you can be wrong. Right, Prokosh. Such fancy talk I don't understand. Hey, Prokash, I want... 
Oh. So you got company, eh? What you want in my house? Tell these characters a blow. There's something I want you to tell me. Uh, just who is this imitation Bogart? Huh? Uh, His look name is up. Dan Lucas. He's the worst hoodlum of them all. Look, Pop, Eddie's time's about up. When's he getting out? I gotta know. I tell you nothing. You heard me. I gotta know. Oh, and you're gonna tell me. You, you what? Let, let go. That flashy tie you're wearing, you don't knot it half tight enough, so I'm gonna help you. And it's not good manners for a tough guy like you to be pushing helpless people around. Stop it, will you? Now, you see what I mean, Stanley? George, look out! I'll take that. See the kind of knife he carries? Yeah. Not the kind you peel potatoes with. Why, I ought to... George, let go of him. I... I just got one thing to say to you, mister. Stay out of this neighborhood after dark if you want to live. Which way do you want to go downstairs? On your head or on your feet? I ain't through with you. You need a procussion. Beat it. Take that collapsible stiletto with you. Let's hope the cops find it on you. Still have nothing to say to us about Eddie, Mr. Prokash? Nothing. You see the kind friends he has? I would rather die we than... Know. All right, let's go, Brooksy. There's one more place I'd like to stop before we meet Eddie tomorrow. What do I know about Eddie Prokosh? Just about everything, Mr. Valentine. Good, good. That's why we dropped in to see you, Mr. Morrissey. Mr. Prokosh says you and the Chelsea Square Association have been helping him out every month. Well, Miss Brooks, we're sort of a political club, as you know. But we believe in really taking care of our own down here. So I understand. Naturally, we hope to win votes. But in a tough neighborhood like Chelsea Square, there are other things that are more important. Giving out turkeys come Thanksgiving and arranging a boat ride in the summer just aren't enough. Oh, we do much more than that. We cooperate with the police, even get to the judge when one of our boys gets into trouble. We've been talking about putting up a playground, too. Well, I could get the bare facts of what happened at juvenile court, but I thought a man like you, whose business it is to know what's going on, could tell us more than that. We understand Eddie didn't even try to defend himself on that stolen car charge. Yeah, I know, but I'm afraid there was very little he could say. He was caught red-handed. Very unfortunate case. But I'm afraid not at all unusual. Say, tell me, Morrissey... Why would a young hooligan like Stan Lucas be interested in knowing when Eddie gets out from the work camp? Lucas? Oh, that one. There's really a neighborhood problem. Mm, I can imagine. But Stan's almost a man now. I don't see what he could have had to do with Eddie Prokosh. Apparently he had a lot to do with him, Morrissey. But it looks as though we won't get the real picture of Eddie till we talk to the boy himself. <laughs> How about a lift, mister, huh? Oh. Are you going in the town? How about a... Oh, I... Why knock yourself out, kid? I'm going back to town. I'll give you a lift. What? Oh, I didn't see you parked under that tree. Hop in, Eddie. Okay, thanks. What? How did you know my name? I've been waiting for you, kid. But we'll go into all that later. I don't listen to Emily. She's just a crazy kid. <laughs> and I suppose you're a brainy old man. Yeah, well, I know what I'm doing. And you can let me off with the next cross and I can get a bus, you know. No, just keep your shirt on, Eddie. Ah, that kid gets crazy ideas. I know what I'm doing. I don't need anybody's help. Okay, okay, so you're on your own. Well, let's set it up this way. Look, I live by myself. What do you say we go home and have some chow? You might decide to bunk over with me until you know what you want to do. I know what I want to do. Hey, uh, mister, you sure you're not a cop? <laughs> well, some of them are my best friends, Eddie, but I don't happen to be one. No, it's just like I said. I had a little talk with Emily while she was feeding the pigeons in the park. You and... mean Emily still sits by that statue and... Well, okay, I guess there's no reason why I shouldn't eat your food. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie. <laughs> There's only one thing a woman likes better than to see a man clean up that last drop of gravy on his plate. Oh, what's that, Brucey? Two men doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I sure packed away a lot, didn't That's I? That's why I was here, Eddie. Go on, rave some more about my cooking to Mr. Valentine. It may help. 
Uh. See you in the office in the morning, George. Glad to meet you, Eddie. Yeah, me too, Miss Brooks. Well, thanks, Angel, for being chief cook and bottle washer. Wait till you see those dirty dishes in the sink. Good night, George. <laughs> oh, uh, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, Eddie? Thanks a lot for the meal, but I gotta get going now. No, Eddie, no. You're gonna stay right here tonight. Now, look, now, I look, said it. You're stewing about something. You can't wait to get it out of your system without thinking of the trouble it's gonna cause everybody, including yourself. Will you stop preaching at me? You got no right just because you give me a meal. I'm getting out of here. Not tonight, you're not. Now, look, kid, give yourself a chance to sleep on it. You may feel differently in the morning. I'm leaving by that door, so get out of my way. Now, I don't want to have to get tough with you, but yes. I'm... Yes? Okay, you asked for it. Sorry, Eddie. Oh. Oh. You asked for it, too. Oh, what happened? Just a little judo oh. trick I had to learn once. Oh. Yeah, it came in pretty handy in Salerno. Hey, Hey, you mean you were in that fight in Salerno? That's right. And the guy coming at you wasn't supposed to land on a nice, soft couch like you just did. Oh. Well, Eddie, there's no reason why we shouldn't settle down and listen to the fights now. Oh, yes. What? When you do go to bed, just remember, I'm a very light sleeper. So? So, don't get any fancy ideas about running out on me. Okay, Eddie, time to get up. Hey, Eddie, did you hear me? Rise and shine. Oh, that's good. Say, Eddie, if you want to try my new electric razor, you can... Why that little... Now, wait. Oh, great. Well, he did leave me a note. That's something. I wasn't asleep like you thought when you went in to take your shower. I even washed the dishes to pay for my room and board. Now, you and Miss Brooks and Emily better stay away from me. You were so anxious to know what I was going to do, now I can tell you. I'm going to take care of Stan Lucas. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about wear and tear. Most motorists believe, and quite naturally, that automobile engines wear out faster when they're running. But that's not true. Your car faces its biggest danger when it's standing cold. For that's when rust, caused by condensed moisture inside cylinders, starts to work. And that's where RPM motor oil can help you avoid a repair bill. RPM's special compounds keep a rust-proof oil film on all engine parts all the time. Whether your car is running hot or standing cold, RPM clings stubbornly to vital wear points. And consequently, rust never has a chance to get started in your car. No wonder it's the two-to-one choice of Western motorists. Next time you need oil, ask for rust-fighting RPM motor oil at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station. While you're there, ask for a free copy of Batter Up. It's a wonderful handbook on baseball, a gift to you from independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure, George Valentine, and to Chelsea Square, a jungle of tenements in the middle of the city and a wolf pack of boys stalking the streets. That's the background for George's present job, the specific challenge to keep 16-year-old Eddie Prokosh from committing a serious crime, as he promised. Good morning, George. Huh? Hey, you only shaved on one side of your face this morning. Okay, so that's the side you can kiss me on. <laughs> but look, we're in trouble, Angel. What? Yeah, playing Big Brother a la Spencer Tracy didn't work out. Eddie beat it while I was shaving. All right, darling, take it easy. Uh, he left this little note. He's out on the prowl. To quote, he's going after Stan Lucas. Oh, no. Yeah. I've got to stop him somehow, Brooksy. If I only knew where to find him down there in that Chelsea district. What pool hall, what dark alley, what hallway. And stand with that knife. What can we do, George? Well, I'm going to have another talk with Eddie's father. Look, you find Emily. But where? Well, she gave us the name of the secretarial school. Call her. Get her to meet you in the park. Maybe she can give us a clue on how we can find Eddie. Okay, George. And remember, Brooksy, it's a race against time. <laughs> He can't 
can't do that. He mustn't. Emily, stop crying. <laughs> yes, Miss Brooks. Emily, I'm not going to talk to you like a child. If you're old enough to fall in love with a boy, this is no time to let him down. I know. I know. You came to us for help. Now we need yours. Can you tell us some of the places where Eddie might be looking for Stan Lucas? It could be anywhere, but I... Yes, dear? I... I should have told you this before, but I couldn't. I mean about Stan. Stan? Did he have anything to do with that stolen car business? I'm not sure, but that's... That's not what I meant. What did you mean? Miss Brooks, you said you weren't going to talk to me like a child. Well, I'm not going to talk to you like I was one either. All this year, Eddie was up in that work camp. I've been going around with Stan. Oh. But I had to. Everybody does what Stan tells them to. I wasn't afraid just for myself, but what he said he'd do to Eddie when he came out. Does Eddie know that? No, you know how men are. And I wouldn't want him to know. Oh, you poor kid. Well, what could I do, Miss Brooks? Stan said he could even stop the few dollars Mr. Prokosh gets from the association. And he needs that money to live on. Stan was just talking. But you don't have to worry about him anymore. Mr. Valentine knows how to take care of him. I'm only thinking of Eddie. If I could only talk to him, I've got to find him. Wait, Emily, I'll go with you. We'll both look for him. All I want to know, Mr. Prokosh, is whether Eddie's been here or not. He knows better than to come here. Oh, yeah. And I suppose that makes you a great father. Hey, look, Eddie's wandering around. A few words well chosen might save his whole life. And all he gets is a door slammed in his face. I got nothing more to say, Mr. Valentine. Well, I have one more thing to say. Your son's out to kill somebody. K-I-L-L. That's the kind of thing you get the big rap for. Even a kid of 16. My Eddie, he would not... Hurt the thief than a murderer. Okay, Prokash, I can't waste any more time on you. A 16-year-old girl had more faith in your son than you have. And I've got to keep faith with her. Well, that stubborn old... Remember me, big shot? Well, at least I didn't have to look for you, Stan. No, you didn't. Because I was looking for you. Jump, boys, jump. Hold against that wall. Okay, Stan. Hold him. Ah, uh, twist his arms back, Slim. Yeah. Oh. I want to do this right. Hey. No. Oh. I owe this mug something. Imitation Bogart. Oh. 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 You had something to say about my knife, didn't you? No. Oh. How do you like it? Oh. Now? I had to carve my initials all over that face oh. of yours. Oh, hey, don't it do it, Stan. Oh, no, I won't do it. It's really going to be a pleasure to work him over so even his own mother wouldn't recognize him. I... I know my diction isn't very good, Lieutenant Riley. Valentine, what's the matter with you? Where are you? Just about got to the hall phone... Look, you got to do me a favor. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But what's wrong with you? I thought I could keep the police out of a boy's life, but it's way over my head now. I need your help, Lieutenant. Okay, shoot. Look, pick up two boys down on Chelsea Square fast. Eddie Prokosh, about 5'8", freckles on his nose, wears a leather jacket. And Stan Lucas, get it? Stan Lucas, yeah. He's a, a dirty, vicious little... Oh. Valentine, yes. you stay where you are. Don't worry, Lieutenant. I can't help myself. I know, George. I know what you mean. The guy doesn't look his best in these hospitals. Oh, darling, your face. Look, what about Eddie? Did they pick him up? Yes. Before he got to stand? Uh-huh. Oh, good, good. Not quite so good. What happened, Brooksy? Lieutenant Riley has Eddie in jail. Huh? They found a gun on him. But if he didn't get to stand, The then... gun was taken from a watchman in a holdup this morning. Eddie? No question about that gun. But, Brooksy, when that guy's wrecking and now this... I know. But, George, what do you think you're doing? Where are you... Oh, I'm getting out of here and have a talk with Eddie in jail. <laughs> Eddie, you gotta talk. What about you and that watchman? What difference does it make what I say? Nobody will believe me. Come on, Eddie, come on! Oh, I, I bought that gun from Swenson, the pawnbroker, just a couple hours ago. What? Yeah, I was gonna use it on Stan. 
Well, didn't Lieutenant Riley check with the pawnbroker to see if your story was right? Yeah, sure, but Swenson told him he hadn't seen me since I was sent away. Uh Uh-huh. Shouldn't be any surprise to me. I should be used to getting framed. Now, look, you told me the truth, huh, Eddie? I tell you, I was nowhere near that factory this morning. I was out looking for Stan. And it was Stan who framed you on that hot car deal. That's right. Well, why didn't you say so when you were arrested? Well, what proof did I have? He would have lied his way out of it. And he wanted to get rid of me so he could have Emily for himself. Yeah, I know all about her going out with him while I was away. One of the kids up at camp told me. Oh, now, wait a minute, Eddie. You got Emily all wrong. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know why Emily was going out with Stan? She explained all that to Miss Brooks. I'm not interested. She was afraid of what Stan would do to you when you got out. And he said he could stop the allowance your father was getting every month. What? You, what's that? You heard me, Eddie. If Emily were giving you a runaround, she wouldn't come to me to keep you from making a darn fool of yourself. Yeah, but... Oh, nobody does anything for anybody unless there's a payoff in it somewhere. Nobody gives a good hoot about me Look anyway. Look at me, tough guy. My face, I mean. Stan and the gang did give you a good going over, didn't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. A very artistic job. You think I'd look like this if I didn't give a good hoot about you? Well, And I, I... suppose the payoff in this for me is going to be a million bucks. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Valentine. I... Okay. Okay, Eddie. We understand each other. Now, I'll show you how much I believe in you. Here, take this. A knife? Yeah, that's right. Wolfpack style. A la Lucas. I don't get it. I'm going to talk to Lieutenant Riley. And you're going to have a chance to talk to Stan alone in his cell when they bring him in. You, you mean you're going to let me loose with him? With this? That's right, Eddie. Oh, that'll be just standing with me. Now, look. We've got to get Stan to talk. And he's not giving out for the police or for me. You're the only one who can make him talk. Now, you listen closely. All right. All right, I don't mind playing ball with you, Valentine. I'm all for helping the kid. Thanks, Lieutenant. But you realize the spot I'm putting myself in, letting Eddie have a knife when he talks to Stan? We'll be right next to the cell door. Go right in, Mr. Morrison. We're coming waiting for you. Thank you. Well, it's good to see you, Morrissey. How are you, Lieutenant? Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Morrissey. Hi, Hi, Morrissey. I see they're keeping you stepping down there at Chelsea Square. I'm afraid so, but we do our best. Well, Valentine, uh, thought you ought to be in on this Prokosh case. Eddie's one of your boys, you know. I know. Yeah, we're going to hear Eddie's side of the story. And if it sounds convincing, we know you'd want to help. I'm glad you thought of me. Okay, let's get going. Sergeant! Bring the Prokosh boy to cell nine. We'll be right there. Okay, Eddie. The lieutenant says you can talk to this guy five minutes. Thanks. Well, well, well. well. Where'd you get out, Prokash? You didn't stay out very long, did you? No. You saw to that, Stan. Come on, you're talking through your head. Am I? You want me to give you regards to anybody when I get bailed out? Emily, for instance? You're not getting out of here. What are you doing? You ought to know this trick. How to hide a knife in your shoe so they don't find it when they search you. Hey, Eddie, put that thing away. I've been waiting to catch up with you, Stan. Folks, stay away from me. You frame me, running those stolen cars. Well, now you're going to pay for it. Now, look, kid, take take it easy, will you? Didn't you? Look, I I, I didn't mean to frame you, Eddie. It was was all a mistake. Help! Somebody help! He's going to... Stop him! I was looking around for a gun, and sooner or later I'd wind up at Swenson's. So you planted that hot gun there. Yeah, 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 that's right. But look, kid... Help get this guy out of here, you hear me? Get him out of here! Well, get him out of here, all right. He was trying to murder me. Hey, what are you doing here? You got a good memory for faces, Stan, especially ones you've been working on. Gosh, Mr. Valentine, it worked. You heard him, didn't you? Yes, Eddie, we heard everything. Look what's going on here. You got no... Shut up! Mr. Morrissey, get me out of here. I didn't do nothing. Well, the less you say, the better, Stan. Look, you can't let him railroad me like that. I'll do everything I can, same as I would for everyone else from our district. I guess you're going to stay put, Lucas. And the rest of your gang will be sent to a place where they can learn to do something useful with their lives. Come on, everybody. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. Huh? Isn't it going to be kind of crowded in here for Stan and Mr. Morrissey? What are you talking about, Valentine? What do you mean, George? That was some nice double talk between you and Stan a second ago. The less he says, the better. The better for you, you meant, didn't you, Morrissey? Look, Lieutenant... And you, Stan, you said, you can't let them railroad me or I'll... Well, I... uh, Or you'd give away the whole works, wouldn't you? 
Morrissey was the real guy behind the stolen car racket and a lot of other rackets down in Chelsea Square. Morrissey, you were using Stan to bully the other kids in the line. That's why Stan boasted he could cut off the little money Mr. Prokosh was getting from the association. Well, you don't seem to have much to say, Morrissey. Everybody knows my reputation. Oh, yeah, I... yeah, the big power of the neighborhood. Big enough to make Swenson the pawnbroker perjure himself so you could be rid of Eddie. I think you can get Swenson to talk now, Lieutenant. I told you he sold me that gun. You, you got this all wrong, Valentine. This Lucas boy here has caused all kinds of trouble. If he tries to implicate me, surely no one is going to believe him. Look, Marcy, you're not going to walk out and leave me holding the bag. Valentine is right. I got lots of proof. Keep quiet, you little rat. See what I mean, Lieutenant? On second thought, it wouldn't be safe to leave them both in the same cell. Mr. Valentine... What's that saying about an old fool? <laughs> well, I don't know about that saying, Mr. Prokosh. Why not settle for another one? Better late than never. Except for you, I would have made a terrible mistake. Thank you. George, come here. Ah, oh, what is it, Brooksy? Look down there, out of the window. Huh? There's Emily and Eddie sitting on the stoop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> offhand, I'd call that romance, Angel. And offhand, I remember a saying, too. Hmm? Speak for yourself, John, if you know what I mean. And now, a message of importance to motorists. The merry month of May means a merry vacation for a lot of folks. And if you're one of them, here's the way to start out safe as well as happy. Just make sure your car gets a vacation check at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station. Do this a day or two before you start out. When the men at these service stations inspect your tires, battery, crankcase oil, spark plugs, all the vital parts, they give your car the same thoroughgoing care they'd give their own. While you're getting this important vacation check, get a new keyless gas cap, too. It has a simple combination lock, no key to lose. And it guarantees your gasoline is safe from theft during your vacation trip and whenever you park your car. Keyless, self-locking gas caps are another better motoring item available at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Oh, hello, Angel. Oh, darling, I thought you'd never open your eyes. Oh, why doesn't somebody turn that radiator off? It's hissing. We're back in the man lock at the tunnel, George. Yeah. Oh, what happened? Well, you were down here this morning, and you must have come up too quickly, and you got the bend. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Then coming up, and then everything went blank. There was another accident in the tunnel. What? Oh, hey, I'm beginning to remember a few things now. And I'm pretty sure I know what causes these accidents. Brooksy, quick, help me over to that phone. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Mary Lou Harrington as Emily, Jay Novello as Dr. Prokosh, Tommy Cook as Eddie, Tony Barrett as Stan, and Herbert Butterfield as Morrissey. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. The Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.